Hey, future respiratory therapists, we're going to do things a little different tonight. I got lots of questions rolling in. I got a lot of questions that I feel like I might can answer in a relatively small amount of time. So I'm going to answer as many questions as I can here in about 10 to 12 to maybe 15 minutes. Okay, so the first one goes out to Teresa Grady. And her question is, is when do I add mechanical dead space? Well, first of all, this is kind of an antiquated, it's kind of an old concept. Like, we're not necessarily really thinking about how we add mechanical dead space anymore. However, your board exams still are testing over mechanical dead space. So the first thing you understand when it comes to mechanical dead space is that it's always the first thing we, we take away and it's always the last thing we add. So when you have a patient with an increased PaCO2, the, the first thing you do first is to reduce mechanical dead space. That's the first thing you do. Now the question has to state that there's an excessive amount of mechanical dead space. So if you have a patient who's acidotic with an increased CO2 and an excessive amount of mechanical dead space, then the first thing you do is remove mechanical dead space. Now the opposite is true too. If you have a patient with a decreased PaCO2 and an increased pH, then the last thing you do is to increase mechanical dead space. Now understand that when we talk about changing CO2, we have respiratory rate, we have tidal volume, and we have mechanical dead space. Those are our three mechanisms for adjusting arterial CO2. If you have a high CO2 and a low pH, then you always start with making sure that your tidal volume is in the appropriate range. And if it is, then the first thing you will do for a high CO2 is to increase respiratory rate. Okay? If they don't say anything about dead space, then dead space isn't a problem. It's not an issue. But if they state that there's an excessive amount of mechanical dead space, then that's the first thing you do. Otherwise, we're starting at tidal volume and then respiratory rate. Now, for the opposite, when you have a decreased CO2 and an increase in your pH, this is an acute respiratory alkalosis, then the first thing we're going to do is make sure that our tidal volume is not too high. So make sure your tidal volume is in the appropriate range. The second thing we'll do is to decrease the respiratory rate, the set rate on the mechanical ventilator. And then the last thing we'll do is we can add mechanical dead space. And that will hopefully increase your arterial CO2 and fix that alkalotic blood gas. Okay, so Teresa, I hope that answers your question. When do we add mechanical dead space? There's only one situation. When you have an acute respiratory alkalosis after you've adjusted for tidal volume, after you've adjusted respiratory rate, and the last place to go is to add mechanical dead space, which will increase the amount of rebreathed CO2. Okay, so there's your answer, Teresa. I hope you enjoyed it. If it doesn't make sense, send me another question. I'll add on it. I'll make you a separate video. I'm going to erase this before we get into our second question. So my next question comes from... Marielle Gonzalez, and what she wants to know is, is how to prevent auto-peep and maybe how to recognize auto-peep. Well, this is real simple, okay? So when we want to know if our patients are having auto-peep, we want to assess our flow scalar graphic. So that's the one that looks like this. Now, typically, this should look like this and it should come back to baseline. And this means that on exhalation, the expiratory flow is completely returning to baseline. Okay, Mariel? If it re completely returns to baseline, then you are not experiencing a patient with auto peep. If you have one that looks like this, and your next breath starts before this returns to the baseline, then 
your patient is experiencing auto peep. Now, typically, this comes down to our obstructive lung disease patients, our C babes, chronic bronchitis, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, asthma, emphysema. Those are our obstructive lung diseases. They typically need a longer time to exhale. Why? Because they typically, because of their disease process, need longer times to get all of their air out. Our restrictive lung diseases, pneumonia, pulmonary fibrosis, pleural effusion, I can go on and on, interstitial lung disease, you know, fungal infections, lung abscess, just keep going, right, pneumothorax, all of those, they typically need a very short amount of time to exhale because they have worsening static compliance and the air typically comes out relatively quick. And so they don't typically need a long exhalation time. So really when you're talking about auto peep, you're really concerned with patients presenting with obstructive lung diseases. Okay, your big two, COPD, emphysema, asthma. I know I said three, but I try to put COPD and emphysema kind of together because we know COPD is emphysema and chronic bronchitis combined. Okay. Now, now that we know what type of patients are typically active in, in creating auto peep, then we need to ask ourselves, why would a patient present with auto peep? And the answer to that is, is that we have a decreased amount of inspiratory flow, which means we're giving the breath too slow. This would create a longer eye time. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase this if you don't mind. So if you have too slow of a flow, that's going to equal too long of an eye time. So that's one way that you might see auto peep happening. The other thing that you might see is too high of a respiratory rate. This causes a decreased total cycle time, which equals a decreased E time. So that's a problem also. Okay. Now you might also on a variance, this is kind of a small level base, but you may also have too high of a tidal volume, which would cause an increase in your eye time. Anything that increases eye time equals decreased E time, right? So your question was how to prevent auto peep. Well, the first way you can prevent auto peep is by making sure that you have adequate flow. So if your flow is too low, then you need to increase your flow, okay? Increasing flow equals decreased eye time equals increased E time, equals decreased auto peep. That makes sense, right? So if your flow is too low, then you're going to have a longer I time, which is going to lead to a decreased E time. So if we increase the flow, we'll decrease the I time, which will increase the E time, which will decrease our risk for auto peep or air trapping. If we have, I'm going to go to this one next. If we have an increase in tidal volume, we can always decrease the tidal volume, which will decrease the I time, which will increase the E time, which will decrease our chance for auto peep. Same as above, right? Just the opposite directions. And then finally, if we decrease our respiratory rate, we will increase our total cycle time which will increase our E time, which will decrease our risk for auto peep. Okay? So those are the three big ones that we can make changes to. Now, why do we typically talk about flow? Because respiratory rate and tidal volume change minute ventilation. So if you can fix your auto peep or your air trapping patient, by adjusting your flow, and you don't have to change your minute ventilation, then you don't have to worry about changes in your blood gas related to either creating your patient to be, if you decrease the rate or decrease the tidal volume, your patient may become acidotic. Just depends on where they are on the blood gas.
Okay, so you want to be aware of that. Now, the other thing we can always do is increase peep. Increasing peep stents open distal airways allows for more gas exchange to be let to more um, distal air movement on exhalation, and so you get a you get a more complete exhalation so that you reduce auto peep. Those are the four. Adjust your flow, adjust your rate, adjust your tidal volume. This this is, should be three and adjust peep. And that should put you in the ballpark of being able to fix your patient that is air trapping and leading to auto peep. Okay? Fantastic question, Mariel. I hope that helps and I hope I answered your questions. Now the last question I want to answer is this one right here. I'm going to erase this. We're going to get to it. And we're going to get three questions wrapped up in one video. So the next question comes from... Um, so we got Quiz Daham. And they want to know how to make the, the ventilator more sensitive. So here you go, Quiz. <clears throat> When you're talking about sensitivity, you're talking about the patient's ability to trigger a breath. You're talking flow or pressure. Okay? Now, to make the vent more sensitive to your patient, you need to understand this. When you're talking flow, you're talking about amount of flow pulled out of a bias flow. So, for flow, we need to decrease it. So, if you have, this is flow sensitivity, flow trigger. If you have a patient on, set on 5 liters per minute, then you need to decrease that to 2 liters per minute. Okay, that'll make it more sensitive. If you have a patient on pressure trigger, and let's say they're set on negative 8, which they shouldn't be, but let's just give you an example and say they are. You have a patient set on negative eight, you need to increase this to negative two. Negative two means that it's easier for the patient to trigger the breath. A flow of two liters per minute is easier than a flow of five liters per minute because the patient only has to remove two liters per minute from the bias flow as compared to having to remove five liters per minute from the bias flow. Okay? So, so this is just understanding what you're talking about. If you're getting caught up in the increase or decrease, when you're talking about flow, you got to decrease the number to make it more sensitive. When you're talking about pressure, you got to increase the number to make it more sensitive. And this is because of this. This is usually what gets people. You got a pressure line here, right? So this is zero, this is negative two, this is negative eight. To go from negative eight to negative two means you have to increase your value. Okay? So don't get caught up on that. At the end of the day, if you can just understand that you need to make the vent more sensitive. That's a lower flow trigger sensitivity and a higher pressure sensitivity, meaning negative two is higher than negative eight, then you're gonna be okay. All right, quiz. If I answered this question and I answered it sufficiently, let me know. This is three questions, guys, in under 15 minutes. If you haven't subscribed, do so right now. Throw your questions up. I got lots of them coming. I'm going to be getting them out. I would love to have a bunch more. And to keep answering your questions as long as you bring them to me. Okay? I love being here as a source of value and information to everybody who's on this journey becoming a respiratory therapist. And I know so many of you are. A lot of you just completed and you're about to get your RRT or you've already got it, and there's a whole bunch more of you here in five to six months that are going to be on that same pathway. And then guess what? There's a whole new group of guys coming in that are going to be on this same journey. I love being here for you. Subscribe to this channel. Send your comments. Send your questions. I love to hear from you. Have a great evening.